Okay, I'm ready. And now we're live. All right, so we are ready and rolling. Look at us. We have actually our first Olympian on our show. Wow, congratulations. We have Monique <laughs> Cavaliers herself here. Uh, Good job. Hi. Obviously. Oh, hello, thanks. hello. Yeah. Somebody that represented Canada for the senior mm -hmm. women's update at the 2004 Olympic Games. Yeah. Uh, she was fans an individual getting her top 32 result. And uh, right now, everybody had the most important result. You yeah. guys got uh, top four. Fourth yeah. place to be exact, unfortunately, because it's Olympic. Okay, this is a wood, woody medal, right? Right, a wooden medal. Yeah, like, I know. It's I know. Like it was the right? right? at the time, but I think now, looking back on it, you should be very proud of yourself. Yeah. Currently, I think you already know this, but maybe others don't. This is the highest Canadian result in fencing in Olympic Games. As it is. Well, I think the guys in 88 men's epee had also gotten fourth, but that was a boycotted, boycotted game. So I, see, I, I see. always I say see. like, hey. There's a qualification <laughs> there. <laughs> <Yeah. and freeze>. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, but, tell, but, yeah, Monica tell me, how, how do you feel yourself to be an Olympian? What do you Pretty, feel? You know, uh, I think it's funny. Uh, going into it or you know you're so driven for me as a, a young person that's all i wanted to do and then um there's sort of an unpacking once you've done uh, trying to realize how close you came to a podium um in normal world cup situations there's you know in individual you tie or on the podium together and i was like yeah. dang i wish they would have done that <laughs> <laughs> so um but yeah it, i think it um it's like kind of I would liken it to somebody who's gotten a PhD. You know, you put a lot of work into it, and it's a dissertation on the end of your of your uh, you know resume of something that you've accomplished that is a loaded. It's it, it has a lot of weight. So, again, depending on the sport, but I know as you guys well know, it's not a sport that you can walk in and just be super talented. There's a lot of a lot of work and a repetition. Yeah, that's true. That is, it's everything. So it's it, it's sort of like. Uh, a, a heavy PhD, I would say. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a dream, right? That's the dream. I've been I've been fencing for 16 years, you know, and I was when I was young, I was thinking like, this is my dream. This is what I want to go for. Olympic Games, no matter what I'm gonna do, I'll be there. But when I'm gonna when I went that deeper, deeper every year, I understood how hard this is. How it's like it's a long journey. I also experienced a quite a significant level of success in fencing. Uh, yeah. I could bring this up, but he's a European champion individuals, right? There you go. Silver yeah. medal. And world, and world and also silver. That, yeah. right? It's quite crazy. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's, but, you know, it's world championships is, uh, it's a bigger beast, right? Like yeah, qualifying for the Olympics is harder than actually winning the Olympics. You know, <laughs> that's for sure. I know what, <laughs> so. what, what, I know what was exactly you're talking about, about these emotions. Whenever yeah. we, I was fencing in the world championship, we were fencing to make a finals and yeah. we were down by three touches and yeah. Tole Hire, he scored one, second, yeah. third touch yeah. and we tied and we go tight, tight and then it's priority and he scored the last point. I, I, I didn't recognize myself at that time. I didn't understand mm. what I was doing on this trip. I was, yeah. I was, I was like crazy. Yeah. I, I hug him. I kiss yeah. him. I kiss him everywhere. <laughs> His sweat was around my face everywhere. I was like, I was so happy, extremely yeah. happy. I, I want to live for these emotions. Sure. I want to. I want to go through again this competition. I want to. I want to go through the same emotions once, if if the life gonna give me a chance. It is. It is kind of you know sports amazing that way where uh, you know you're working when you're really in it at a high performing high level um there's things you don't think about because you're just so focused on the details and what has to be done rather than when you're younger and you're like oh this is hard you're not thinking it's hard because it's just what you got to do to get there That's and so true. when it happens um you, it is an outer body experience and sports great to, to, to experience that sort of ex, you know you, you you dream about it or you have expectations or hopes of what you're going to get and then when it actually happens you're just sort of you can refer back to the timeline and say yeah that it i can see all the boxes being checked to have had that but still there's a question mark 
if it can actually transpire into this experience or this emotion or this memory. Um, and, and, and I'm sure that the two of you can recall many matches where you come up short and you can relive it like it's a painful, you know, yeah. nightmare. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Like, oh. A lot of people, a lot of thinking, a lot of people thinking that it's too hard. It's a really hard journey, but they never look behind. They never look what they've done already. There is the huge, the huge, the back, what they've done yeah. already. Yeah. But they looking at the look for looking forth and looking, oh, it's too hard, it's too far away, this goal's yeah. too far away, but they never look behind. And it's hard too because the path in front doesn't isn't very clear and the path behind you've sort of seen yeah, it happen and hard. you're like, okay. And you take for granted like, well, let's let's ask ourselves, like, what would you have said two years earlier? Would would you have expected it's sort of it, there's a little like, you know, you have to kind of mentally make sure there's an acknowledgement of that, especially with your coaches and your teams and your traveling. Because um, the experience as a whole, it's pretty awesome. Like, yeah. I, found, I, I found, you know, traveling the world with my best friends, uh, That's true. you know, living, live, going to cities and then actually having to accomplish something when you're there and then go checking out the city. Like, uh, you know, I think it's, my husband would say to me, he was a professional hockey player and he would go, oh gosh, you know, like there's a smaller group of you. And he goes, so you don't get paid much. I'm like, no, we don't get paid at all. It's not about <laughs> money. Probably. No, and It's he goes, about their environment, right? It's an environment to be at, right? Yeah. To and he would say every day. Yeah. It's a pure, it's a pure moment because nobody's making you do it for a paycheck or you feel like, and, and yet he goes, so you're doing this for glory. I'm like, I guess so. Okay, <laughs> like, why not? I think well, that's uh, st talking about your uncertain path, as you mentioned, and uh, we're obviously going to lead up and in get into Olympic Games. Uh, I know a little bit the fact that we mentioned, Yarik mentioned journey. You took quite a journey. So talk to us about how did you end up bouncing like through across like various parts of the world just to get there and that uncertainty that you were talking because nobody's guaranteed that golden ticket. Right? How does one stay in the sport and not say, you know, so let's go. Talk to us about that. I started in modern pentathlon and, Ooh, I and I, I, yeah, so I was, you know, 96, I saw that women's epic didn't get into the, women's epic didn't get into oh. 19, I'm a bit older. So uh, 96 women's I, I, epic I got in. I couldn't recognize it. <laughs> You're very kind. I'll pay you later. <laughs> so, uh, but the women's epi got in and pentathlon had said you know yeah there's a chance we're going to get in at 2000 and i was already saying you know that's a risk i can't take i really want to go to the olympics and i could start to recognize that i was enjoying coming off training and how old are you at that point in time <sighs> i'm gonna say i would every day is 18s every yeah, day yeah you every, know what we know that whatever the age she says that right now that's what the age we're rolling through for the rest of the show <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, okay there we go i in 96 let's see i was uh i, I Gosh, what am I? I'm going to be, I'm going to be 25, 24. I was Perfect. older. Oh, so so I was only fencing, pentathlon fencing, which you guys know is like. I was just going to say it. Like, one hit wonder. You know, I'm good at a few moves. I'm fast. So I'm getting the job done. I got one touch. And he's like, I'm a rock star. And then I yeah. fence with fencers. And I'm like, wow, these, these matches are long. And, <laughs> and, yeah, 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 that's true. And what Especially in epic. And why isn't this working anymore? I do this and it works all the time and now it's not working. And, and so I, I, you know, it was a bit na naive that way, but so I, I jumped off and said, I'm just going to fence. I, w I could see I was enjoying it more. And then so you, got you, chose the, you chose the harder way, right? Yeah. I came in really late. I walked in as a smiling Canadian pentathlete, like, Hey girls, <laughs> I'm going to fence. And I could see the girls in the, at that generation were a little like, like who are you and who do you think you are and they're like yes 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 and i was like oh so i recognized very early on that it's not like when you look at track and field and you see pentathletes on the on the track they're by the way i am totally getting inspired right now i'm like okay she started at 25 just started to fence i'm 30 ish i i, I want i want to go back to fencing i'm 31 listen Continue, continue. You guys, you could do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a son. He has a two kids. Uh, you yeah. know, we have to support our families. So I, that, so that's at this like, point, is it's impossible right now, and, especially and in the US. That, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the point. Is like yeah. when I started to realize that I wanted to go down that path. Made the national team. We did. Um, 
I think uh, 98, we did 99, we did Pan Am Games, came beat US, had a silver medal, beat lost Oof. to Cuba. So it was, it, was, it was sort of like, hey, we can actually qualify in our zone here. Did, didn't qualify in Sydney, but did go to Sydney Olympics because I was working with the Toronto Olympic bid. So that was an amazing experience because I got to experience Olympics without the pressure. Shireen, my best friend, my teammate, um, she was competing, watched her compete, and then she had approached through a contact from her coach, said, hey, Danielle Lavavassar was, was uh, kind of opening up. He had, I think, some spots. Laura Flessel was sort of moving on from him as a coach. And, and, she this, had asked, and at this point in time, you've only been actually into fencing. Five years. Five years. Five years. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, but can you tell me about uh, Daniel a little bit more? What did he? I will. Mean? I'll get you there. Yeah. So he, okay. So he, we'll so, gonna go back. Yeah. Yeah. So so Thanks. Shireen asked him if she if she could train with him, and literally, she asked him, and he said okay. And my head popped out from behind her and said, "Can I come too?" <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. And he looked. It was like, "Okay, fine, you can come too." So I went to we like pretty much. I had to come home and, and raise a lot of money, pay off debts, and spend about a year just getting my stuff together. Shireen left a little earlier, and I think three months I left to also just sold everything. And to your point, like doing that. I moved to Paris, got a little apartment. Um, my family thought I was nuts. I was 31, guys, 31, and say, I'm going for it. Because the, the thing that always drove me was, you know, I'm going to sit back and say, you know, I wondered uh, what would have happened or I, I wish I had, you know, what would have happened if I had tried, you know, fear and how we kind of unpack things and we want certainty. Even as we get older, it's harder. I'd have friends having babies, getting married, buying houses, yeah. getting cars, and I'm leaving to go do what? And sometimes I'd put myself in a bubble because it was- You don't want to hear anything yeah. from the outside, yeah. right? And that's Single what, and leaving, and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> that's what our kids, the young generation should know. Never, it's never late. It's never late no. to start. No. It's never late to continue. And it's good for us yeah. to know that too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what's also true is if you have a, I, one thing I could feel when I transitioned out is that I, I had a lot of grit as in, I, I may not have been the most talented person, but I was going to outwork you. Mm -hmm. wow. Like if, if I, we would do physical training sessions with some of the girls in, in fencing at the time. And I remember being like, All right, you know, as a go. coach, as a coach, <laughs> no, I can do this. as a coach, I prefer more hard work people than talented yeah. talent yeah. can, it's like a bubble. Yeah. You can explode. That's it. it. And then yeah. nothing happens. Nothing happens. And the grit is the element where if you fall, you're going to get back up and, and you're not getting uncomfortable, getting uncomfortable. Like yeah, that's true. it's, it is learning. Like even our kids now they go for runs or they do little things physically. And it's like your mind gets to decide a lot of stuff and you either are a victim to it or you're in charge of it. So it's just recognizing, oh, this is uncomfortable. I, I am much more of an external kind of extrinsic motivator. So when I see other people I'm competing with suffering, I go, okay, let's go. Let's see if I can make, I'm going to try to not look like I'm in pain either. So there's nice. a game being played, right? Like, I know that's a little hard. Monica, went, uh, tell, tell us uh, how many years you've been in fencing. It's like uh, I fenced for 15. 15 uh, years. Yeah. So I started really late, 17, because I wanted to do pentathlon. And then I changed over at 24. 15 then, years. So uh, you, you're supposed to be a very disciplined person, right? Yes, you, absolutely. Yeah, like self-driven, self-driven. Your coach can't make you want it. Your mom and dad yeah. can't make you want it. Like uh, at the end of the day, if you're not, like a little nuts a little like nuts in a good way in that yeah nothing's yep. gonna deter you like i i can understand people getting you're also truly serving like your desire you're going after you were making sure you're not leaving anything on the table at the end of it yeah. right like and and i i can say that there may be some people in my generation that said wow you know i could have made it and i'm like yeah you could have but so you desperately you? <laughs> like, you desperately believe in your achievements right? yeah or, or just or, and also I, 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 you know, Shireen was incredibly, an incredible teammate, incredible friend. I'm watching someone my sh by my shoulder who uh, I see and train with every day, who also is showing up with the same commitment and is winning. 
And I say, well, if I can beat her in training and she's winning at a World Cup, why can't I? So I really am a big believer on, in finding your tribe and, and getting your herd, like the herd of people you're training with, like the culture's got to be good. And sometimes it's not good and you may need to decide to change that. I like the way you're thinking. You, first of all, you have to believe in yourself no matter what happens. And yeah. people around you, the environment has to believe in you too. So mm -hmm. you can inspire yourself. Mm -hmm. and people can inspire you this is mm -hmm. the team this is the whole of all the team when you believe in each other that's how you can fence in the team if you don't mm -hmm. believe that this person can back you up unfortunately this team never going to succeed no for sure and and i think later down the road when we were actually in a qualifying two years in that relationship between myself and shireen catherine Danette. Uh, Julie Lepran and Mariev Peltier, those five, even though Mariev didn't go, she was just as part of qualifying and how well we did. Even though we don't, she doesn't have that on her resume, she is just as much a part of that. And we lived and trained together for two years wow. in that experience. So you are, so at this point in time, we're circling back, you know, we're like a, trying to make a Quentin Tarantino type of movie, yeah. flash back and forth. So, okay, so now you're in Paris uh, in a small apartment. How's that process looking? How's that training process looking? Um, training process was here also. It was a bit different. Where first, it has to be. It has to go without mention that there's no way I could have stepped into Paris. And this is not trying to handle compliments, but Peter Ho changed it for me. Like he was the guy I had for eight years, and he was also rather new to. Canada. Probably one of the smartest individuals I've ever met by none. You know? And what I liked about him is he would be like. I remember feeling as I walked in, he taught me through osmosis, like if you don't show up, like if, if I see you ready to go and doing your workload, I'm not gonna create language to say, good job. He's just like, okay, Monique, you're ready. Where everybody else would go, well, well I would've been here first. Yeah, but you're not, you're not doing anything to show me that you're ready. Like That's if right. you're not- Don't tell me that you're proud that you won some little local competition when there's fencers that are trying to win world championships. Like, don't. Yeah. That's, and, he, yeah. and he was also very much like, if you're going to work hard, I'll work hard. But if you're not going to work hard, I'm not going to really waste my time. Mm -hmm. And so that was like, I can understand that. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course. Uh, Coaches like, also see that. Coaches yeah. also see that when the person put the efforts, at, sure. athletes putting in the efforts in the bout or in the lesson, yeah. and, and the coach the same way. Mm -hmm. The same way. He putting the pressure the same. But if, if you're being lazy, you're late every time for your lessons, come on. I, I, you guys see that, this. and, and yeah. every coach does it. It's like, that's true. Uh, you know, every, I, I can see it in my kids' activities, and I say this to them all the time. Like, you know, the expression is, oh, you're being a tryhard. I'm like, you know what? Your dad and I, we're tryhards, and uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, we, I'm sorry. He so made the NHL, and I the want to be it. It's like, right. we're... It, it's not a it's not a, a bad thing you know there's you know, be socially smart but you monica the best example for your kids with your monique. with your husband wow monique know, sorry they, monique. They get this <laughs> name right yeah, because it's yeah important. That's important. <laughs> my bad sorry uh you're the best example for your kids and with your husband that's that's uh there's a long journey from being an athlete and accomplishing your goals though so the people your kids should know who you are sure. and who, who you become it's because true. of training the example, hard. Yeah, the example needs to be there, but I think what's a challenge is that what's different in our kids' generation is there's so much high-intensity um, like rep programs. There's a volume that these kids get, so they're not getting multidisciplined in different sports to try different things because you, you, they're not able to. They get streamlined so early, and and the parents want it just as much as the kids where when we grew up, my parents would be like, okay, so where am I taking you? Like they had really no investment. And so it really came from an internal drive rather than, uh, oh, there's a approval I'm getting because I'm doing well or that I'm doing this. And that's, and, and, and my parents, my husband and I, we really try really hard not to be crazy, but we love it so much that we're like, okay, wait a minute, right? This has got to come from them if they want to do this, even though I really like going to watch them play yeah. <laughs> in their sport. So what yeah. they do, well, no. what they do. Uh, our daughter's, a, she likes to swim. She's a competitive swimmer. So she's a grinder, a gritter. She's well, 
for COVID swimming, you know, five, six days a week. And then, which is, and she's 13, which I feel like is a lot, but that's the sport. And then the little guys hockey. So, uh, yeah. and I was, and I was always thinking, I wonder if Tim would ever come out to Burlington to start a club. But, uh, and we will definitely discuss more of that, okay. Monique. I'm in. I, I, I was looking forward to it, actually, just before the quarantine came in. Yeah, but, again, and I don't mean to a stickler, but, you know, I would love to learn more now that you have that mentality that definitely Peter Ho has instilled into you. Sure. Uh, you know, how is it looking training in France? Training We're in at France. Daniela well, Lusser. I can remember my schedule right away. Uh, we would train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, and we'd start at 4.35 when we'd go till 9 o'clock. It's not uncommon. And I think the reasons we couldn't fence on Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, the foil fences were there. The volume was high. We'd get a lesson. I'd come in. Shireen was always first. She'd get her lesson 45 minutes. I'd get my lesson. And I remember not speaking French very well. And I was still using a pistol grip. And I did that for about nine months. And then I realized with the, you know, Shireen was fencing pistol. I was fencing with a fence master who was really good at pistol. And I was like, all right, I'm, my parry part's not going to be so good. And here I go. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm going to be offensive. And the, the, the lessons were, um, I remember feeling uh, perfection's going to be, is always, it's, it's never good enough, which you kind of got to get used to. And you realize that, okay, that's, I, I want it to look right and feel right and be right. And so there's always a demand, like a dancer almost like, do it right, do it right again, again. Um, not a lot of praise if it goes well. Um, so you can't be somebody who's looking for pats on the back. Um, Danielle, I remember one time wearing a heart monitor just to sort of see, and you'd, you'd have your lesson and there'd be some days where, you know, like, you didn't know when it was going to be like this, but, but I remember looking. Him, right, he was. Yeah, uh, I would look at my heart monitor and going, does that say, say 200 beats per minute? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say, I'm going to die. Wow. So, that was that was the intensity i think what i noticed i i came into that with a little bit of an injury on my hamstring i thought oh you know so Money, for how long for how long that lesson was the lesson would be 30 to 45 minutes high intensity intense less yeah intense, wow. and it would be three days a week so mm -hmm. that i get that every every practice but <laughs> then what started this was in january i remember starting in january with him and then once the season sort of started to end, because I came mid-season, um, in the summer, then it was just a different, he, one thing that was really awesome is he was being now approached by the International Fencing Federation to go kind of abroad and, and coach coaches how to coach. Yeah, he was beginning to get recognized as one of the best right around that time. It took a long time, but... Sure. So this is like back in two, 2002, and I remember... By that point, uh, I had shifted, I think, eight months into to, to just a pistol grip. And then he was getting invited to these, okay, we're going to Brazil and we're going to Beijing. Um, and he would be, well, I need people to demonstrate with. So he would take Shireen and I. So we got, we would go into the belly of the beast. Like we'd be sitting in like Beijing going, oh my gosh, we're going to train with the Chinese. Yeah. And then we, we would do like these camps where he would just be giving all the infant, like training the trainers. And then yeah, in the yeah. evening, the deal master was. Class. Yeah, wow. master class. And then he would say, okay, uh, now the girls got to go train. But then the girls on the Chinese team at the time would go, oh, I got, a, I got an injury. Oh, I can't. Yeah, they don't want. like, oh. <laughs> from, but they would from go Chinese team. Yeah, from but Chinese they were team. watching train because Shireen was really, really good. So like, yeah, we want to take a peek at that test. And yet okay. with me, I'd be like, what about me? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I mean, it was it was fun because you you were doing a lot of observations. You were so immersed in it. This is like five six hour days. We did it in Brazil. We did it in China. We did it in Canada. We got back here. Um, and so tight schedule it, right wow. yeah it was it, that intensity and that's was, all just for the like these master classes presentation yeah that's but how do you including the how did you yeah but how did you feel after this kind of schedule did you have you know, a break or free time to enjoy yourself we, or something like that i think i wasn't working by then but in by september i started working and my employer was very aware of my schedule so i'd come in for a few hours a day i i had my physical training that I did on my own, but I was so strapped for cash that I did a lot of my right. physical training 
theme parks in Paris, okay. which I ain't gonna lie is fun. But I mean, here you I am you know, looking at the Eiffel Tower yeah. and I'm just doing my exploding, you know, any type of the workout I would get. So Danielle was amazing in that every Monday or Sunday night, I'd get an email with my entire schedule for the week. You so was, it was planning your schedule? Or yeah, so, another, yeah, cool. No, he would, he was like, I, I still have the binder where every, mo every Sunday night I'd get an email and it would be Monday. This is it. This is our lesson. This is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes we'd go into it and we, our lesson would be different. Like it wouldn't, wow. it wouldn't happen, but I would be, we're going to work on this, this, this. So I had a little bit of an idea, but it, I knew that if things in the lesson, I didn't. But, but also after a while, you already know kind of the mistake perhaps you're making that he's emphasized. So you already know that like for next two or three months, we're basically working on that. For example, feign disengage and that's it, <laughs> you know. And then we would get like a breakdown of what we would do in matches at practice. So you're going to do like, you know, three, five, fives. You're going to do a one minute overtime or like, and it would be broken down that way. Then Tuesday and Thursday, I'd be given my physical training. And sometimes there'd be physical training on a Wednesday or a Friday. Mm -hmm. We'd get the weekends off, but this was just only at the beginning. And then when things started getting closer to the Olympics, our, our you know, weekends, once the season hit, it was at one point, like, the volume that we did was one thing I think as in North America that we missed, that the volume was so high and the, the caliber was so high. So as a, as a Canadian coming into a World Cup or even like some of the French circuits, that you didn't get that level. So you would just be like smacked in the face and then you'd fly you home after two right weeks. Away. Okay. You're fencing all, you guys get it. You're fencing the volume, like we're doing this tournament, this tournament. At one point, I think our, our, our team, the girls on the team, Catherine and Julie and Mariev, they were coming over to Europe because Danielle started to decide, hey, uh, maybe I can be the national coach for these guys. Yeah. Um, and as a result of that, they were traveling and doing a lot of training camps with us in France. And I could feel that our national, like our, the team's national like motto was, don't yeah. think about it. Like if yeah, you yeah, think yeah. about how yeah. hard and heavy this is, <laughs> it's, you're just going to crumble. So we were just like, he would make a demand and we were like, ah, okay, whatever, just do it. Don't, don't think about it. <laughs> like, don't, <laughs> anyway, don't question it, just do it. So the volume, and I think it made us, you know, there was a moment where you sort of look at your competitors uh, or you're at a World Cup and you would see within your group, Mm -hmm. that you would look to your competitors and your other countries and nations and you'd go, you guys, yeah, okay, yeah, you're good, but you don't know what we've just been through. So get out of my way. <laughs> it's yeah, like, that's true. There was There's a level of confidence. I tell this to my kids all the time, not just kids, students in general, where it's like, technically, if you have super good technique, yes, that will help you a lot to score. But you may have an opponent against you that their technique may actually be a little off, but their level of confidence is levels above you. That it's just gonna always work for them and it will not work for you. It's always you gotta be able to match both, right? And that's what you're talking about. You just went through hell and back. And when you're coming back fencing anybody, it's like you have this, you know, hard shell on you now. It's like I'm, so, I'm just coming out to do my job. Yeah. You're physically so you know, you've been through a lot and I, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. And you can look at it, a competitor. Sometimes I would, I would look at the girls that were coming from or the women that I had fence against in Cuba. And I recognized that there was such intensity because this meant more than just fencing a match. I was like, these ladies are trying to survive. Like I, I, I don't, wow. Like, that that's intimidating. That's like, this girl's going to take me out because I am in the way of something greater than just a win for her. So yeah. how do I compete with that? So it's true, like that confidence, but also knowing we say this all the time, you know, if you know you haven't cheated or cut corners or made an excuse or made it, you know, gotten uncomfortable and you're choosing to just continue to lean in and say, all right, I, I'm, I'm going to, you're not, you know, cower or, or take a step. And then the change is how you walk into this, onto the strip. You can, if you can see it, the confidence comes from there. It's your past experience. It's how hard you worked and prepared for sure. So how are you actually, how are you on the strip? Um, 
Maybe we can actually... Not very fast. <laughs> no, that's what... a lot. First of all, that's a lot. I fancy not so long ago. Let's not, let's not get too far away. I, will, uh, I have a strategy. I appear, I appear very slow at the beginning so that people will see when I try to do something fast, it seems a lot faster than it really is. <laughs> yeah, that's, actually, I've always thought of that. Uh, now that I'm older, I actually always enjoy fencing uh, adults that have fenced for a long time and that maybe used to be very athletic, but now they don't. They still obviously don't want to lose, so they started using the skill. And I just sit there and I learn. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's very cool. So speaking of skills, when you were going to your World Cups, um, by the way, have you ever, did you go to World Cup, your first World Cup, while you were in Canada or is it already when you moved across the pond? Yeah, I, I was living in Canada, so I was doing the whole go there two weeks, oh, do two World Cups, come home. I did that from probably 1998 to, so about four or five years I did that and it was expensive and yeah. I could tell I was like, ah, these ladies are, that's why I said, I got to move to Europe because some of them were that were married and had kids. I'm like, how are they able to do this? They're just going in a, on a train ride to, you know, you know, I don't know, somewhere in Germany to say, oh, now I'm going home. I, and we would be like, I got to get on a plane. <laughs> it's like, it's hard. It's hard. Very true. Um, and from what I know, like around those years, especially like around Olympic games, like I, because I'm from Eastern Europe, I know like the Hungarian team was fairly strong. The Hungarian. Absolutely, absolutely. You ever got a chance to fence against any of those girls, like those oh, Nagi yeah. girls? This, this is what was kind of the, the, Hungary was ranked number two in the world at the time. They had Minsa, they had Naj, they had, uh, oh, they had a few, like they were just insane. And then um, I think we had a World Cup in june or so just before the olympics in cuba and at a team event and we got killed by hungary like 45 i don't know 25 it was not even worth mentioning then oh. uh we had a training camp and danielle our coach was able to get us to have a training camp i did i think we did two training stages or uh, stages in in the hungarian national training facility yeah. Which was incredible. So we watched all of them fence. They fenced us. I don't think they really thought much of what we were. I think Danielle's strength was training hard, but he was a pretty good tactical and technician. Like he had some great strategies. So he was, I could remember feeling like, why am I getting so many left-handed fencing? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> why? And I think he realized you're going to get hungry, left. girls. You're going to get hungry. Yeah. I remember they had that, I think there was, Two of them that were lefties and strong, and Naja just won. Was it, so, had the super strong lefty. Yeah. Well, Naja uh, just won the gold medal the day before, or two. Days uh, who was fencing? Who was fencing a Hungarian uh, team that time? It was Minza. It was Naj who won gold, and Minza came bron had bronze two days earlier. And then there was. Um, oh, I know. I can see their faces. Oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank. I remember there was Nagi, right? Nagi, yep, right. And then there was a uh, really. Oh my gosh, I, I we chat all the time. Well, not all the time, but I see her on the. Saz. Uh, no, Saz was just. A, she wasn't on the team then, but she was. I would train with her at the national facility, but it, she wasn't in there yet. But. I could tell, holy cow, this girl's a lefty, yeah. she's a bullet. <laughs> like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, 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 but when we were fencing at the Olympic Games, we got them uh, first round. And, and that was the big kind of, what? Because we yeah. had moments throughout our year qualifying where we beat Russia once or twice, and people were like, what? Yeah, 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 that and was then, a surprise. And then U.S. was out of the mix, so we realized we were qualifying, and then we'd never gotten cracked. And I, I think what happened was the, the year before the Olympics, we had beaten uh, Russia, and we had come, we hadn't, we'd lost to France. So every country in the top four, like France, Russia, uh, yeah. Italy, Hungary, they, we were we beat Italy at a World Cup team event in Hungary, and so there was there were certain things that were like. What was happening is I think other countries are starting to recognize, okay, Danielle's doing something with this team. And yeah. now don't don't take them as a walkover because there's something. You guys were up to notch in your training. You were no longer in this Canadian bubble. You were definitely. Oh. And I think we also had a pretty good process where you would fence. I know I did it individually as an athlete. And I think it was being done on a higher level with our coaching staff. 
which was every, I would write, I have a book where I'd write every match down and I would dissect what happened in the match. Yes. And even in, in period one, two, and three, um, when things would go, just so I could So what was, were some of your tactical then approaches when you know you're going up against this Hungarian team or any like the French girls or anything like, what were your Monique Cavalier, some go-to tactics, like the anchors that you were sticking to? Okay, the anchor was always review what you did last time. Yeah. Like yeah. I, had a, I had books and said, okay. And, and when I feel like I could, I, we didn't have iPhones to video and review <laughs> performances, right? Like we couldn't, it, we had to, and I think that practice created a language for myself to recognize. So I, and also Danielle was very aware. So fencing in Hungary, I knew Naj uh, was, you know, she was pushing me. I, I know that I would always require, you know this, Tim, I, I, if I'm going to get you to stop, I have a French grip. I want bigger distance. I'm not getting it because you're coming in as a, as a lefty with a pistol grip and you're really good defensively and you can take my blade. So I would often, my, one of my strategies was, People would say this, okay, watch out, Monique's gonna hit you in the knee. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'm gonna make you want, like, I'm not gonna go so low to get myself in trouble, but I'm gonna go low enough that I'm gonna, my timing and tempo would try to get you to be a bit flat footed. And, right. and that would just create uh, an awareness for them to not try to get too, too, too close. close. And, 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 I, and I would often start with that, and it wouldn't be. And that's, it's a great tool for control, right? You were just mitigating your opponent by doing that. You're making sure they could never really be, get comfortable, and then you can play off of that. Beautiful. And I think often when, when you do a lot of absence of blade or when you had a French grip and you're trying not to get in their blender sort of thing, um, yeah. one thing that I, I could say that I was strong at was just uh, you know, doing a lot of attack into preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, being per very accurate with the tip and just looking at the hand. And again, if I could land, uh, start to get ahead of the game and, and see the knee or the hand or the attack into preparation, then I, I would sway the balance in my end mm -hmm. because then they're thinking and they're hesitating and then I have more opportunity to, to try other things. Um, yeah. So that's sort of how I would always And play. like, would you say, and by the sounds of it, I think, yes, like were you conscientious and about when you feel that I'm either unable to dictate to your opponent or when you start to feel like, oh, she's beginning to like bite on everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, bite on everything. And then it's at that level, no one's, you know, I can't recall. I don't want to say this with 100% certainty, but at that level, nobody's going to get slaughtered. No, like, you, you're not at that I level. You're the never. <laughs> but I mean, uh, at training, you would think, Oh, okay. Even your own teammates who you know so well, if you're really good, you're never going to get a slaughter. And if they are, then, you know, they're giving up or they're like, like there's a part of you that knows it should be that ugly and that tight. And you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I think yeah. my struggle was always just staying calm in those moments, yeah. especially in the third period, trying to really recognize that it's going to be your mind sort mm -hmm. of, receiving the information and trusting the skill. I, at times I could struggle wanting to uh, react to what was coming rather than dictating. So that's yeah. why I would try to spend a little more time setting up what I could do and what I, would, what I did at the beginning, I would start throwing in in the middle and I, 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 want, I wanted to see question marks. I wanted to, you know, you can see a lot of body language. There's doubt, there's a frustration, but at that level, you weren't gonna see that from Naj or Minsa. <laughs> It'd be like, okay. But so. Monique, uh, Monique, I was uh, I wanted to ask you like you were fencing at the uh, Olympic Games 2004, right? Mm -hmm. But there was there was supposed to be Olympic Games in 2020, right? It's been like 16 years. Right. Do you see fencing changing, or great, yeah. or fencers are fencing in the same way, the same approach? What do you and, think? Uh, it's interesting because uh, Natalie Mulhausen was, uh, when they were here for Pan Am Games in 2000, was it 18? So uh, Danielle yeah, and her... Last summer, right? Yeah. So they yeah, were here at my house. Really yeah. So Natalie and, and Danielle were here and I came to go watch her fence and I could see a lot of Danielle's style. I can see that it's his style or his approach. I'm finding myself watching it and going, wow, there's a lot more French grips. Like that French style is really permeating into the system. Like that uh, like finding the line, high line and, and threading the needle. And uh, um, there's a different style. What I find is also, if you cannot move, 
you're not going anywhere. And that, I think I st- there's more athleticism. There, you can't stand still. I see somebody, if I see a straight back leg, if I see a leg that's not, cr- if it doesn't look like it's going to be a spring or a catalyst forward, like, you know, that, that moment where you can see that a leg true. or a knee, I go, okay, either you're really good with your blade to stop me coming through or, or you're not able to move. And so, so I would try to, you know, like it's I see a it. lot less now, like these complicated actions, right? Yeah. All these double, triple disengages, counter pair repos, all of that. You definitely see athletes more setting up the situation, distance, moment, execute yeah. maximum one tempo disengage. And it's like, it lands. Athletes have become very good at hitting these days too. Yeah. It's funny, I was watching, when Natalie was here and then she did World Championships, we were watching, in, I was in Sweden and I remember watching us to watch the last, the feed and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And when she, when she landed the last hit to win, it was like, it was the riskiest move. It was like- By far the riskiest move. That I know, it was like, I was like, I'm like, she, it was in a moment where she flashed, then pulled back and just did like the, the, like the wood chop sort yeah, of thing. And I was like, I don't know how that like so it had been she'd done it a couple times so the the sports changed i can see you've got to be able to move there's more explosivity you can't there's not going to be a lot of this flipping around which i think is true because i did run into you then so so funny how it worked out for those pan am championships because uh daniel lavasser and natalie milhausen uh they contacted peter and they came to tfc for a couple of days to do a little training they did a lesson which i happily filmed you know and and of course then i took my daughter and we went to watch the championships in toronto it's like there's a unique opportunity and i was watching her of course and then i believe she ended up getting the bronze medal and then whatever we run into i was like oh wow i made it just connected of course monique would know them right and so I'm assuming because you guys, I saw you guys all leaving together, you hung out at some point in time, right? All yeah, three of you. Yeah. They were my house. There you go, right? So maybe a little over dinner, a little vino. And yeah. obviously a couple of months later, we didn't find out that Natalie becomes a world champion. Yeah. And now I have a question. Like, what was her mentality two months, like being a bronze medalist now, two months before world championships, I know she has also a tough, like, personal story. That's something she's been pretty open about from what I've seen. But, like, what was her mentality? Like, was she expecting to win? What was she driven? Like, if you care to share and if that's okay. I I think some of my observations was I didn't, Natalie had, when I first met Natalie, she was fencing when I was fencing and she was still in Italy, competing for Italy. I remember her asking me at a training camp that I went to in Italy just before I retired saying, what's Danielle like? So she was still quite young and, and, you know, had a style this time around, there was uh, a a woman who um, was very focused, Mm -hmm. uh, incredible shape, disciplined, mentally and physically. Yeah. She, um, and I would even say there was a lot of uh, mindfulness in where she would spend her energy in her mind. Mm-hmm. Like she wasn't going to waste her time being negative, like there, anything's possible. And, and I think that's her message to herself and what she's presenting to others is like, really, I can't believe I did it, but I can believe it because that's what I really wanted. And it's really a matter of what you put your mind to. So I think what I could see was a, a, a person who was very clear on what she wanted to achieve but was aware that if it didn't happen her qualify at that point it was like if I can qualify before January I'm I'm golden if I don't I think I'll, I'll step away but there was yeah a, an attitude of uh, and I'll be okay with that the, uh, you know my who I am so really her view was more the games right not that yeah. immediate world championship yeah for sure and and it was fun because now I I was supposed to be in Tokyo right now also not obviously competing but my role with the Canadian Olympic Committee is as an athlete mentor so I work with athletes in their preparation I mean, and I'm that, available to that's a yeah job for you. Uh, can, can you tell us uh, about the mental preparation a little bit more because you know more stuff about, about this than, <laughs> than we are so for, yeah. because we, we are struggling you know? 
yeah, we are struggling with the kids about it because they are afraid of going on the strip. They're afraid of fencing yeah, certain hate. fences. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we kind of, we kind of struggling, as I mentioned. So we, we trying yeah. to understand how it works, how we can uh, calm the people down mm-hmm. a little bit to just make them focus better at the boat. It's a job. Yeah. It's so prepared. yeah, because it's getting more intense every time. So I remember for myself wanting to win so badly and looking at some of the best in the world. I remember seeing like Britta Heidemann and Laura Flassel and Nash, and they all looked different in how they approached it. Mm-hmm. And at times I would say, uh, mentally I would say like, do I have to become that to win? And I would say, I, I, I don't want to be that because I don't, I don't, I don't can't be that. It'd be like trying to teach myself to write with my left hand. I, I just, it's not coming naturally not to me. Exactly. So I think as a coach and as an athlete, the more you can embrace what your preferences are and recognize them as strengths mm-hmm. and realize that you're not to become somebody else. Like the comparison syndrome is just the kill of joy. Like, I can't be Laura Flessel, but I can be Monique. So what is Monique? And if I spend more energy being distracted, which was my challenge, by what's happening outside of myself, I'm in trouble. So I had to really create an umbrella for me. Some other athletes that I would see were so detailed oriented and so calm that you would, you would assume like, do you have a pulse? Like, do you even want to be here? But they were deadly but at times now doing the work that i've done i can recognize that is their their need to be at their best and i think as a coach and as an athlete to understand where their preferences lie and so that you're reading the message as what they need to be at their best because i can't i couldn't ask someone to be in their face aggressive like you know screaming yelling and and if that's just they don't want it yeah, that you could see that. And I would always be a bit impressed by the cool, in control, because that was the opposite of what I was. And I was like, ah, I need to work on that. But I think the biggest thing as an athlete, I think, is if you really need to know what you're good at, and even though we spend a lot of time working on what we're not good at, if you think that there isn't some strengths that make you you know, eligible to be there, then you have a problem. So I could be maybe not good at this, this, and this, but if that list is all I focus on, I'm in trouble. So with a lot of the athletes I ask is, tell me the three things you're good at before you tell me the three things you're not good at. Mm -hmm. Very important. Because if you don't know, and especially as a woman in sport, you're like, oh, shucks, which I, I'm, I think it's changing. I can see it changing, but they're, you know, we're like, okay, well, you know, I'm not really good at this. I'm not really good at that. I'm like, can you tell me what you're good at? Like, I want to see that. The, like, yeah, I'm, I'm good at this and I'm good at that. And I'm like, okay, good. You got to know that just as much. It's well enough. Sometimes yes. we don't, maybe I don't, I don't know if it, it, it's harder. It's harder. Yeah, and something maybe you could help us. Uh, I, as a coach, have noticed I do struggle with sometimes to deliver that positive belief, right? That positive thought into an athlete. And uh, whatever, I try different approaches. And also along the lines of that, sometimes it's difficult to deliver just like a message that has a tactical and a technical component, whatever. Like, again, the a simple feint disengage, but a, po- a fencer always knows in the lesson when to do, a, how to do a feint disengage, but then to translate it into the bout is not always there, right? Well, I guess, what was the best way for you? What was the coaching style that you felt like you approach, you can hear them, right? Because sometimes I notice you can say feint disengage, student can't do it. You do, you know, Take this way, go around that way. They don't do. But at some point, time you find this key phrase. They're like, "Oh, I get it. Why didn't you say it like that?" Have I you? Know. You know, I, I wish they all had operation manuals. You know? <laughs> so this is another one. I could tell for myself with Peter Ho, um, and I don't know if it was because he was new to Canada at the time, but he spoke in a way to me. He used a lot of analogies. It's, I, I would joke. Yes, they. It's just say, he's like, it is like the water lily who flies. Oh. <laughs> like, I'd be like, oh, okay, I get that. <laughs> yeah, totally he makes would, sense. So yeah, if it's, would, eh? 
imagery for me, but, and I don't know if we were just dumb lucky, um, but that made sense to me. And, and I know that Heather uh, Landingwer was training and Tanya Tagesson were training. And I'm not sure how it was for them or what his language was to them, but that it, it, I understood that. And I think the toughest job that you guys have is realizing that they're all different. Yeah. And, and, we, and, and in the work I do, we do like a lot of assessment tools on personality type. And that helps define, okay, uh, this person really wants data and this person really wants to make sure that it's understood and you better come in with a clear argument. Mm -hmm. um, whereas other one want to be inspired and motivated and feel like the idea and there's a bigger cause. So, and, and that means my message is going to have to come in differently, even though that it is the same boiled down. It's, it's who they are is, is, is hardest work for you guys. And I think as an athlete, as you get older, understanding who you are um, and not feeling like it's a shortcoming, but it's a strength. The students, the students are all, all they are different. So uh, that's why we have to find a different approach to all of them. Mm -hmm. so, as you mentioned, some of them needs to be motivated, inspired. Yep. Some of them needs to just simple hug or some, some yep. support or the other stuff. So we have to find a way how we can just knock their head a little bit. I know. know. It's hard too, especially when you lose. Like yeah. when you're dealing with someone's loss, like, uh, you know, how much room do they need? Or, you know, sometimes I would, I would hear the self-talk of myself. Like, it was like, okay, well, like that's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> like you're going to, or the, you got to, you sit in it a bit and then you got to move on and create a little space. And, um, I think it's the responsibility of the athlete to sort of try to figure that out. And the coaches, I think, can help them sort of figure out who they are, knowing that, you know, they, they, you can, I, I really, I've heard this recently, like your, your biggest strength can also be your biggest weakness. If mm -hmm. you don't, if you don't sort of assess um, how it's serving you. So recognize I'm good at this, but I have some holes or gaps in my, my plan mentally and physically. And so I need to <laughs> fill them in, but, yeah. All right. So let's get back more to a fun note, actually. You know, oh, come on, you know, for all. Um, so, Olympics, you know, you're there. You know, uh, how was it? Like, again, my, my dream, Yadik's dream, you lived it, let us live vicariously through you. Opening ceremonies, how was the athlete situation to live there? The competitive juices. I know, it's pretty, it, it's pretty, uh, uh, surreal. Um, again, I went to Sydney and I wasn't in the village, so I really was able to sort of be a little calmer in that experience mm -hmm. because I had already been through an Olympics, so even though I didn't have the pressure. And so this time around, I had an expectation. The opening ceremonies, all of that is just mind blowing. It's exciting. I have filming of it. Uh, my sister, who's a, an actor and kind of like an art, she edited. I read on Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a lot of interesting facts that if you want to share with our viewers, you can go ahead. There's something to be proud of there. <laughs> something to be very she, proud of. She did. She did a great job. So that was fun. But as soon as the job got down to like, okay, opening ceremonies are done. We're competing in three days or something like yeah, that. You, uh, you know, there was a schedule. Yeah. Yeah, did Schedule you practice on. before? Did you practice before the yeah. uh, competition starts? Right. Yeah. You uh, yeah. you were having a lessons besides that, but there was a probably there was a pressure in you, a lot of pressure from the people who's around, who's like fencers around. They watching you. The they know how to fence. They like trying to analyze how to fence if they but yeah. if they know bracket, right? But, but in a world in a World Cup, you're doing that more. But at the Olympic Games. Uh, everybody really was so spread out and so that I don't remember even the few days before we just fenced each other. Like we didn't even get to. And your coach wasn't with you, right? Like, he was, Danielle was there. He was giving us lessons like oh. in the village. She was sleeping in the village. And I can tell you, he's, I have videos of him sleeping a lot because he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, so we were in the village. We like lived in our apartment. It was sort of like a, a training stage. Like again, um, the only the weird thing was that, like as soon as we walked out, out of, we were in a, in our little apartment where all the fencers, we all shared one, one apartment. And I remember the, like, uh, Josh was there and I forget who else was there, but we walked out onto the balcony and across the little courtyard was the French, uh, you know, village, French, you know, athletes village or apartment building. And on the entire building was this life-size 
picture of Laura Flessel screaming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Come on. It's like they knew it. <laughs> they knew I was it. like, are you kidding me? So that was motivating. And then the team event, the individual event was first. And I remember Danielle saying to me as I'm warming up, it's all like your every nerve is like, like yeah. the process of how they send you into you in a venue and send you out it's so formal and you're like we don't and what was your plan going into like obviously you're hoping to win that's without a doubt but like yeah. what was your personal goal my personal goal in in uh was it an individual uh was just win the next match yeah. like i i didn't i didn't want to i didn't have like i knew shireen had huge pressure I on know. her um, and I found myself just win the first match because I my expectations were just you know I had wanted to go to the Olympics and here I was so I'm like okay so, and you away, you're like, <laughs> and, <laughs> but the funny but the funny thing is is I had like my first match and I remember we was fencing a girl from South Africa and Peter it, Danielle had said to me okay so when you when and if it's your touch the first touch or not I want want you to scream as loud as you possibly can yeah. to get yeah, yeah, to spread emotions oh, yeah. just to feel relief probably yeah and so yeah. in that first touch i remember there's a great picture of it and i look at that picture and i laugh because in that picture i am screaming so hard that i pulled a butt muscle <laughs> <laughs> i was like i mean i'm like oh i think i hurt myself <laughs> so they, what happened two days later because I had pulled my butt muscle, yeah. I'm in the back training. It was a hamstring. It, it was a hamstring. Let's say, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's gotten so bad that I can't, I'm, I'm realizing it's now limiting me okay. in my lunch. And so I called the, the I, we, with the medical were there, there, it's incredible. Every need or want or whatever, I have one of my toenails popping off and I'm realizing I got to pull the hamstring. Finally feeling like a professional athlete, right? Like the way it should have been done. Like I wish that would be like that all throughout, right? For us. Oh, yeah, I know. It would have been, it, it's, it's weird because you're looking at, why am I getting so much help here? Like, this is bizarre. I don't normally get this. Well, so, you're special, that's why. Yeah, now you're special. <laughs> but then I remember about half an hour before fencing my first team event, we were all the, you're behind the barricade and you're warming up. And I realized I need something done to this hamstring because I'm about to fence. And so the medical said, okay, we'll freeze it. So I go into this room and I've got my leg up and he takes the needle down the shaft of my hamstring and says, tell me when I hit the bone. Oh, oh he And I go, bone. okay. And then he, I don't even have to tell him because he can tell he's just hit, the, hit my hip bone because he's just gone the needle into my leg and then go, freezes my, my hamstring. Oh. The assertion of it. So I come out of the room and I'm white as a sheet. Like, what the heck was that? Yeah. Like, I, I can feel like I, I don't feel any pain. Yeah, that's it. The pain's but gone. That was, I was, but that was kind of gross. Like, what? I didn't, I didn't. And then I remember Britta Heidemann walking towards me and she sees me and she kind of looks at me and she's like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Because apparently I lost all the blood in my face. I'm like, sure. I looked like I was going to pass out. But it, it was fine. So that was kind of a fun little thing. And then we start warming up and we then fence uh, hungry, which... Uh, but yeah, this that it's just okay. blew my tough mind. Team. You're some of the best fencers. Tough team, but the harder thing was, I think, where we all kind of ah. Oh, it's then we fenced. We, our match went so long that our turnaround to do the semifinal was against Russia. That our turnaround was literally five minutes. Yeah. Who and you were fencing for the bronze medal? Guys? Uh, we fenced France in the bronze France. medal. Oh. But, so, but we but with Russia. We were down going to the, the last period. It was Shireen and Luganova, and they were tied 35 35. And if so, whoever came out of that match was going to get a medal. And yeah, so we that's lost. The thing. that was the medal. That she one was do, like, I, I remember not, handing the cord to Shireen, going, Good luck. Like, and she was trying to be like intense, but you could tell Tatiana and Shireen were both kind of pooping their pants. But you were behind <laughs> her, right? So you, you saw yeah. that she couldn't stuff, handle right? the pressure, right? Well, so you saw her fancy. Well, she handled the pressure she, she well, was, but she just yeah. was like, she knew what the responsibility that was being placed on her. And um, it was hard. Like I looked at her, I was like, dang. Like but, in the moment, you're not thinking about it. But then Tatiana and her were both wisely being very cautious to sort of how it was. And then... If, if you know Tatiana Luganova, yeah, she I has know fenced her. 
one, yeah. I, I can tell you she's done it to me and she's done it to many, many fencers that she will score one touch and then she'll stand there and just say, okay, now it's your turn. And she'll s literally just wait. She, like she it, good at, it's, she good it's an parents. arrogant move. <laughs> yeah, she plays that game a lot. And I was like, okay, so she walked into that with Shireen and, and it happened where she landed the first one and then just said, okay, now you gotta come get me. So. You know, Monica, it's, it's uh... You know, Monica, it's a very interesting journey. It's like, it's incredible life. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous because uh, I did A lot jealous for me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have a chance to, oh, I'm to sure go you to did. Olympics. But, but you I wish one of my students can do it. And we appreciate that you You're were welcome. being with us. Really, it's, a, it's an, amazing, an amazing talk. Not and very... you're an amazing person. Thank you so it's, much for this. No, well, thanks for inviting me, guys. Yeah, Monique, again, super, super inspiring. You know, it's uh, no joke. It's not very often that it's like that. Sometimes we have podcasts where I feel like, you know, we're more technical. And other times it's just like, it's flowing and I want to live life. You know, so. That's good. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Monique.